I knew I realized I was getting old when I was teaching when uh, I was making Top Gun movie references, <laughs> and the kids are like, "I know I used what, to, what's that? What's that?" In my jazz band, I used to always say, "Was it over when the Germans bombed Pearl Harbor?" And I never say it is. <laughs> what's up, YouTube? All right, so if the stream is on, we're all on. <clears throat> yep, I'm going to mute myself, Lee. Just give it a minute and you can start. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, if you're on the West Coast or out West. <clears throat> this is Dr. Lee Whitmore, and I am the Executive Director for the Grammy Music Education Coalition. And I'm so happy that you could, um, and appreciative that you could join us today. <clears throat> this is the second in our new series of um, the Hub Live, their virtual town halls, where we're addressing um, issues and solutions and challenges for music education, um, given um, the world that we're in today with students learning from home, teachers teaching from home, these dramatic changes in how we're all, you know, not just in school, but how we're living our lives. And today I'm, I'm super excited. Uh, I'm opening, but we have a, a, a GMEC staff member, a Grammy Music Education Coalition staff member leading the conversation. And uh, he is our Strategic Education Programs Director for the Grammy Music Education Coalition located in New Jersey, um, Dr. Ryan Zellner. And I'm gonna turn it over to Ryan now to introduce our guests. Uh, Ryan, it's all yours and I'll be back toward the end of the session. Excellent. Thank you, Lee. <clears throat> We're ex very excited to bring this panel to you today. Obviously, things have changed in schools and they've changed a lot and we they had to do it very quickly. So with us today, we have Frank Makos, who's uh, from the Phil School District of Philadelphia. We have uh, Sean Smith, who's from Craver Music, Latasha Castillo, who's from Passaic County Schools here in New Jersey and Jim Frankel from Music First. So the first thing that we're gonna ask is we're gonna start off with Frank and just talk about some of the challenges and successes and things that you've seen happen within the district. And then maybe some of those things that you see as we get quote unquote back to normal, some of those things we see carry over into next school year. Cool, hope everybody's doing well out there. Um, I only see a couple of people, so hopefully there's a lot of folks tuned in, but um, yeah, I'm excited to, to share some of the work that's been happening in Philadelphia because our teachers have just been superstars since this whole thing started. Um, it started March 13th with uh, a half staff show up for a day that half our team couldn't come because they live in a county that was quarantined. Uh, we had one day of schools open and I had the privilege of teaching some kindergarten classes and then from there we've been at home and so it's been a whirlwind of trying to work with our district team and be part of the planning process for what digital learning looks like and then communicating to our 450 arts educators, 225 music educators um, around what their role is, uh, both communicating with students, developing content, and then really in, in more cases than anything else, becoming leaders in this work and helping each other out and, and building, finding a way to build community even from our bedrooms as I am today. Um, so. From strategies, it really started with uh, two things. One, before we could even get on a call to talk about district-wide plans, uh, music teachers across the city were starting Facebook groups and text messages and whatever form of communication they had to start sharing ideas and, and um, creating different ways to develop and, and, sh and uh, pass out lessons to their kids and everything from Instagram Live to YouTube ch uh, videos, um, you name it. And so after a few weeks of that, um, we tried to kind of merge the work that was already happening with a district-wide plan, which was really to migrate over to Google Classroom and to funnel everything there. And then so we asked uh, for the teachers to contribute to that process by just following a real simple Google form uh, lesson planning format that where they create the lessons and they can add links or upload videos um, that goes into a bank that teachers can then access. So we are, I believe, in phase three right now of our digital learning plan or our continu continuity of education plan. Uh, phases one and two was really just about getting packets out to students. 
Uh, phase two was about preparing the teachers for the transition to online and then getting devices out. Uh, the district purchased about 50,000 Chromebooks, uh, a very quick process. And then um, we spent two weeks of professional development online. This is the end of that week. Next week, we go live with um, the third phase, which is what we call enrichment and review, where teachers are just uh, starting to formalize some of the interactions with kids, spend some time online and in Google Meet classrooms, um, and then engaging a bunch of different online tools. Some of them you'll hear about um, from my colleagues today. Um, and then we are now going into the final phase of planning, which will be some planned instruction for the end of the year. So the only difference being in enrichment and review, we're just keeping kids active on things that we've been doing throughout the school year. And then as we go through May and June, we'll start to introduce some new content for our students. Um, it's been a Herculean effort on both sides. The teachers have been amazing and flexible with, with understanding Google Classroom and all the different components. And then, you know, my colleagues at the district, just uh, their, the effort to make sure that everything was clear and clean and um, usable by everybody, but also that nothing was left out. And so that the arts are very much as part uh, of the important work in, con in the continuity of education. Um, so, you know, I think I, I touched on some of what's been successful. I think the one thing I would definitely highlight has been the camaraderie amongst colleagues. Um, you know, things that if we go through our typical district-wide process to, to make sure everybody has approval on and make sure we're, we're meeting all the different guidelines, things take quite a bit of time. But without that luxury, we just jumped in and went for it and everybody's uh, been quick to you know, be agreeable, but then also to, to bring forward challenges. And then, you know, last thing to touch on is what we think will carry over. You know, we've heard so much around what's the new normal gonna be, when will it happen, all of, the, all of these different things. And I think the, the one thing that, that I shared with our arts teachers when we did some email communication was for all of what's happening, we're hearing the words improv, make it work, you know, creativity. These are things that our teachers are known for. So um, I'm excited to see the shift of, of how our teachers are so present and prominent and not only social media, but you, know, you turn on Good Morning America, you turn on any of the national news, there's all these different features everybody from students to teachers to celebrities are doing things with the arts. Um, it's really just pushing forward the, the need for arts in our lives as human beings. I think that'll carry over when we get back to um, buildings and classrooms. And then I think more importantly and most importantly is the, the mentality that everything that we've done and have thought we have to do, um, you know, changed overnight. You know, we had to cancel big festivals that we, we hope to be able to bring back in some capacity, but, you know, our teachers that might have been resistant to adopting online tools or, or including some of the technology, you know, they're, they're jumping in full force. And, you know, I'll kind of close my piece by saying the thing that I think has been most amazing is our teachers who have been our superstar teachers that we rely on for student teaching and developing content and leading professional development sessions with things that they've been doing as veteran teachers for 15, 20 years, to see them transition in that same leadership capacity with this new set of tools and new decks, it's really just highlighted that great teachers are great teachers. And um, I think they'll all go back into their classrooms with a little more confidence that some of these new tools that we might've been resisting for, for a few years or including different components of music um, are, are gonna be part of the new norm. And we're excited about that. Yeah, I think Frank touched on a very important point there, the sense of community, right? If any of you follow the Facebook, the music teachers page, which has, you know, tens of thousands of members, it really shifted in, in sort of being this, you know, I'm an outsider sort of looking in, but it really shifted from this idea of like, this is what I'm doing with my program as maybe a sense of pride, or at least that was the impression I got to like, here are the tools I'm using, and this is what I'm doing, and I need help with this, and I can't find this, and I've created this list of resources, and, and you really get a sense of sort of bonding, I think that's happening within the, the music community, and I think Frank touched on that with within happening within his music district, and then also opening it up to these music technology tools. I know one of the things that struck me when I started teaching Back in the last century, in, in, in 1998, I remember walking into the band room and I was like, wow, nothing's really changed here since 1983. And you, you don't necessarily look at like always what new technologies can be brought into traditional music classrooms. So I'm really interested in Sean's point as, uh, as Quaver being one of those uh, programs that's been in use in schools. You know, has, have, we, have we seen an uptick in this? Have we seen this opening up to new teachers? You know, what have you seen from your perspective, Sean, as far as... Um, you know, use and just integration of this music curriculum into traditional curriculums. 
Yeah, cool. Thank you. Well, thanks for including Quaver Music and me in the panel today. I really appreciate it. And thanks to music teachers. I think it's important to remember that a third grade classroom teacher has 40 kids. Uh, a K-5 music teacher has 500 kids that they're having to engage with. And I think that's a really important point to make. They have lots of students. Um, so interestingly, the first thing I wanted to say is I've probably done 30 trainings with different districts. Philadelphia was one of them. And every time I see the district leadership create a sense of community, I don't care what resources available, it's very apparent that in troubles, implementation goes a lot smoother because of that sense of community and those communication channels. Um, when we were on a call with Philadelphia, uh, Frank and, and Nathan were both on the call. So it was really helpful to have them there and have the teachers know and you, and you understood that sense of community. So I've seen phases as well. I kind of look at it as two phases. Phase one has been what I would call enrichment activities and kind of exit tickets. So we know that they're engaging in this activity. Um, and so I would say what I'm seeing is teachers are the equity barrier right now. Their comfort level of how they want to engage in this technology is really the level that their students will be able to participate as well. And my goal is to train them from where they are to get them to the next place. So I'm seeing simple links of our types of activities and other um, resource providers, because there's lots of resources available right now. So we're sending out simple links. Some teachers like, I just want to send out a link, take a screenshot of the fact that you've done this in this activity. And then that way I know you've done it. I've seen teachers creating really cool, rich, almost tutorial videos in a YouTube channel. And they're uploading them even into our platform and creating activities around that. Um, all the way up to Zoom classes with students participating. And you'll see the students over on the right panel and the teachers going through an activity. I had one in Miami who was doing um, Peter and the Wolf and she was asking about the different themes, the melodic themes and what character it was. And it was really fun to see the students engaging. So the technology resources are super available and companies like Quaver and all the other resource providers like Soundtrap and GarageBand, they're all providing them for free now. And so the goal is like Frank said, how do you get the teachers comfortable with willing to like engage on the level that as a student they're comfortable in, you know, almost like bring them in on the level that they're willing to learn and then train them. The most important component I can offer at this point is not so much the availability to our stuff as it is to say, how can I help you feel comfortable using it so your, so your students can benefit from it? And then in phase two, I think there's a great opportunity for us and me just as an advocate for music education, as well as just a Quaver, um, you know, Quaver sales director. And that is, how can we start to use these now that you're comfortable with learning this, take time to really hone your skills around technology, learn to use these composition tools and have submittable content come back to you as a teacher and revise and send back to the students and look for ways that we can like level up their ability as teachers to use technology in all those different tools so that it's really a powerful educational component. So same kind of thing, like the value in composition is not so much in writing a song, it's in going back and editing it and revising it and sending it back to the student and having those types of channels of communication. Or if you have students doing recorder type functions at home, have them perform those recorder type functions in front of the family, incorporate the family into some of your bucket drum activities or your found sounds activities. These are like general music classroom activities. The beauty of the general music classroom is it kind of takes into account that most of the students in the class have very level, varying levels of music knowledge. So what a great opportunity for your student to say, hey, this is a found sounds thing. So you don't need to know how to play trumpet. So now you've got these valuable kind of like global opportunities for uh, general music activities that your student in fourth grade could actually teach the brothers and sisters on how to play the other found sound parts and then use the technology to record them doing it and upload that as a submission to you as a teacher. So with Frank, I agree the same thing. Like I think the goal right now is get the teachers in this time we have, reach out to the vendors and say, hey, train us up so that we know how to do this so that when we transition into next year, this is really a powerful educational component of how we teach outside of our classroom. And then if we see these rolling kind of um, shutdowns, then the, the transitions are really easy and kind of seamless. So I think that's the goal right now is there's lots of great technology. I think we really wanna focus on supporting teachers so that they're confident using it. Oh, and I wanna make sure that everyone knows that our Quaver Music I would, would be remiss if I did not say quavermusic.com slash home 2020. That's our resource code. So please feel free to take advantage of our offerings as well. 
Thank you, Sean. And, and I, I was thinking the every time something changes, it changes something else, right? It's sort of the butterfly effect of things. And I, and I remember I teach brass methods course at uh, Montclair State University of music majors. And I remember asking them in the fall, I said, how many of you, um, how many of you actually like compose music? And you know, two hands went up and those were the student composition majors. And so that was like, how many of you just write songs just for fun, just like lyrics or whatever? No hands went up. And I'm wondering by injecting this sort of music technology and this sort of virtual space now where this becomes another outlet and perhaps we won't see that as a, as a result anymore, where we'll see this idea of many student uh, songwriters come forward and composers and that creativity sort of come alive again in music classrooms. And I, and I think the other thing I was thinking of when you were speaking, Sean, is the idea of, you know, I think personally of how to teach music traditionally first. How do, how do I do that? That wasn't to you, Jim, but the, you know, how do I teach it for, how do I teach it in, in this face-to-face -face method and then technology as a supplement? But what if I flip that and said, what if I could teach everything through this technology lens and really maximize my time and expertise around what is important in teaching the students? You know, where can they find these additional resources that come up? Where can they go out and get these things that'll help them become better at whatever they want to do for that end product. So I, I think by interjecting that into, uh, into the stream, so to speak, like, I wonder what the effects will be later down, down the road of that, you know, many of the music majors, and I think at about 28 of them in the course, many of them really look to be those sort of like traditional band chorus orchestra directors and weren't really thinking about music technology or those components necessarily as a main part of what they're doing. So I'm wondering if that's going to, that's going to alter, uh, the sort of the future of how music education majors even come into the system and prepare for future generations of students. Uh, we got a question for you, Sean. Could yeah. you please repeat the Quaver code? Oh yeah, it's uh, quavermusic.com slash home 2020. Then we have a question for Frank, but we'll come back around to that one. And so as we know, with Philadelphia, it's in a very large school district, 126 thousand students about what 250 school buildings and so as sort of the the opposite of that but the same in some ways I invited Latasha to come on from Passaic County Schools to talk about what it's like in New Jersey but Latasha if you can give some background on your district to start with I think it'll be important to frame that because of course when we think about New Jersey at least I do I think about the the maybe the more well-off communities than I do the the sort of harder hit communities so I think you know speaking to the challenges and and, and what you've experienced and some of the successes, of course. Sure, thank you so much for having me on, Ryan and Lee. Uh, Passaic uh, Public Schools, we are um, in the city. We are 3.2 square miles. However, we are very densely populated with 15,000 students. So we really do have that challenge of being in North New Jersey, we're about 12 miles outside of New York City, and we just have a lot of students in a small area. So our biggest focus in reference to distance learning and this new approach that we're all addressing is student success. So we wanted to make sure that no matter what happens, we want our students to have a level of success, regardless of what the differences are in the home environment. We have students who live in homes, we have students who live in apartments. Two children in a home, seven children in a home. So when we began the the option of designing curriculum and thinking about tasks we wanted students to do. We wanted to make sure that no matter what, we thought about their success, regardless of what types of access they have to devices, internet, um, or any other resources that we have available to our students in the school realm. So I think some of the challenges that we've dealt with, number one has been connecting with our students. That is the primary goal that I've been talking about with my team is just making that connection, speaking to students, seeing the students are all right. Um, we've had this beautiful web of support between our classroom teachers, um, music, art teachers, our dancing theater teachers, really just getting out there and working together to make sure that we're checking on the social emotional learning uh, components for our students. Um, our town has been hit hard in reference to this um, COVID-19 virus and we're worried about our students, first their social emotional learning, we have a lot of families that are impacted with the loss of, of family members. So we're really looking first at that, making sure that our students are whole, they're there, and they know that they have a there as a resource. Um, and we've also been thinking a lot about accessibility. So making sure that students are able to connect with us. And we've kind of taken a three-tier approach to making sure that all students are still able to be educated 
in this distance learning environment. So the first is that we've created tasks that are accessible, regardless if you have a device, internet or not. So our district has worked to have packets. We are actually getting ready to enter into phase two and we are shipping packets to homes. We also are lending students Chromebooks if they need them. So parents are able to come in and pick those up and we've been doing that for a few weeks. Um, we have our mayor who's um, incredible, who's been working with other vendors. If folks don't have internet access, making sure that they can connect to those vendors who can help to support students and families around that. And our second approach has really been building community. So we've been launching out Google Classroom with the, the Google Suite for our district. And for the first time, all of our arts based teachers have launched that. And they've seen a wonderful response from students who do have access, connecting, sending pictures, um, making videos of themselves, showing and demonstrating their knowledge and learning some of the tasks that we're asking. So we're really excited to see that there's a level of engagement because our teachers are seeing between 500 and 800 students in a given week. And now they're really able to engage one-on-one -on -one with these students in their individual classrooms. Um, and then the next thing that our teachers really have been working on is instructional videos. So they're creating videos based on our tasks so that the students have a way to connect with the familiarity of the teacher that they know and that they love. And they're able to have somebody demonstrate some of the skills. Uh, we're putting a lot of that content on some of our teachers' individual YouTube pages so that students can have the opportunity to visit it at their convenience. We know that we have many children that have several students in the home. So we have high school students who are on our APEX program taking courses. So they may be on the device for a long period of time during the day. This is really helping students access the information, even if they're not able to get on between the traditional hours of eight and three. So we're really working hard to make sure that our students have ultimate access to what we're trying to provide um, and connect. Uh, we're also working with our AP classes, our music tech program, helping students push out and think of innovative ways that they can work using other devices or access that they have in their homes or in their communities with friends. For the next level of work, we're really starting to think a little bit more about how we can infuse some more of these technology programs for our content. Uh, we are one of those contents that we're very hands-on and our teachers really did have to flip their thinking because they're used to having students right before them. And so we've been working a lot with developing some videos for instrumental. That's one of our larger concerns because we're concerned that students may not have the environment to practice um, just because there's so many different living situations. Um, and we want to be thoughtful of that and we want to support students and their families during that transition. We want to make sure that we tell them, you need to do what's right for your home and your family and know that we're going to support you regardless of what that might be. And just really focusing on giving them more ways to surround the conversations and the music in their life. So talking to their family members about their favorite types of genres or music or musical artists, listening to those found sounds, really seeing that music is encompassing every step of where they go from the stories they visit to what they hear in their neighborhood and really helping them connect to the skills that we've been instructing them on throughout this year. And hopefully when we get back, we can continue to instruct them. Thank you, Latasha. We do have a question and I'll get to that in a second, but I also wanna reintroduce in case you uh, joined late, we have Frank Makos, who's the executive director for the arts in the school district of Philadelphia. We have Sean Smith, who's with Craver Music, uh, Latasha Kesselow, who's with, uh, she's a supervisor of visual and performing arts for Passaic County. And we have, uh, which is in New Jersey, and we have Jim Frankel from Music First. And I think this question goes to Latasha and Frank mostly, but Sean and Jim, feel free to chime in. So from Tracy, she says, I am preparing a virtual assembly with an artist for my K through four kids. What do you recommend I do to ensure equitable access for my students? Let me know if you need me to read it again. I mean, I think that based on what I've heard the question is, you know, definitely sharing that information out, um, connecting with the students directly if possible, with families, uh, and share that information out how your district normally share that information. Um, I think equitable access is hard because you just may or may not know what tools the student has. So I think if you have it and it's put out live, that's amazing. If you're able to report that information or if you can share it out with students who may not be able to join live, um, that would be incredible. And really sharing that out with classroom teachers, with principals, making sure that we can reach our students 
and giving them multiple opportunities to access that assembly, that would be, I think, incredible and really valuable for students to, to grow and learn in the content even in the home. Yeah, I think I say pretty much the same thing I would add, you know, just make sure you're looking at different distribution streams, um, whatever the main source is going to be and first and foremost, right, with my litigious administrator hat, make sure you're using something that's district approved at the at the base for us it's all about Google meet right now. Um, but then, you know, whether it's broadcasted live through various channels like it links to Facebook live or Instagram live or you know if you can't do that in multiple streams then make sure you tape it. And then it's accessible via a, a bunch of different mechanisms. Um, and again, depending on if, if the district has distributed devices, use whatever you know those devices will link to. Um, then if not, then I, the next step is to just think about where kids are now anyway and, um, and, and make sure that the content's available there. And you can probably reach out to some organizations to help, um, you know, just within the bandwidth of folks, you know, there's, there's paid services you can use like Eventbrite does live uh, broadcast. There's uh, uh, if you have the advanced versions of Vimeo, you can send out, like, you can just click a button and it'll send to five or six different social media streams. So even if you or your district doesn't own that, you probably have a partner that's working with you in some capacity mm -hmm. that will find that for you. Uh, one of the suggestion too, that I uh, got an email earlier that was reminding me that Houston, and I'm pretty sure it's Houston, has created an environment in a partnership with their public TV channel. So even that, I mean, it's old school, but like sometimes old school is what works. So yeah, take that recording and don't think about the things that you're not normally considering because we're so tech savvy. <laughs> Yeah, I think that was one of the things that really struck me. I remember when schools in New Jersey were contemplating going to, you know, the online environment, and then they eventually did. I got this, you know, a massive, like, an email, a text message, a phone call from the local school system that's, that's like, you need to fill out the survey. And I was like, okay. So I went online and I filled out the survey and it was like, do you have access to internet and do you have access to a device, you know, whether it's an iPad or laptop or whatever. And I was like, why are they sending this? Like, who doesn't have access to, to this in this day and age. And I think that digital divide, that equity distribution of those resources, was, it was shocking to me. And I know, Frank, that, that you struggle with that, which is why the purchase of 50,000 laptops. But I think I remember seeing something, um, it was something like, four, was it 60% or 40% of the students there didn't have access to the internet? It was a very high number. Yeah, in, in Philadelphia, and, and probably I'm sure it's the same in a lot, of, a lot of large cities, you know, we partnered with Comcast, who has had a running program for many, many years for, you know, uh, low income families to access. And the school district partnered with them to make sure that that was available and free to all families for the duration of the stay at home order. So that's how we can use that. And then, yeah, to Sean's point, you know, we have a, a TV run, a district run TV station, PSTV, shout out to them. Um, and I know they, them and WHYY, which is our local PBS affiliate, have both been active in, in conversations about how information and content, everything from, you know, broadcasting the, the virtual assemblies to teacher training and, and family training for how to access some of the portals. So I think that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. that's something local radio, everybody's looking for content and good stories. So if you're doing something like that, you know, it's a good, good thing to reach out with. Ryan, if I can mention one thing that I think is Absolutely. really important is that as teaching um, administrators are thinking about instruction, it's really not to assume that everyone has a device. And it's amazing some of the stories that we've seen in our own district where, sure, there's a device, but someone needs that device to go to work. So yes, there's a device in the home. However, that person needs to take it to their workplace. So now there is no device. So really not assuming anything and really thinking about what the home environment is for our students and how we can support learning in it. Um, and just giving any opportunities, as many opportunities as possible for students to have that win um, and that learning process. Yeah, and I think it's important to think about in, in that, that all ages, right? As far as I've even talked to some college professors who said their students didn't have access to laptops or Chromebooks and that they were mostly using their phone trying to do their online assignments rather than, and then the school would loan out equipment to sort of come up with that. But I think oftentimes too, you, you hit this, I hate to use the word divide again, but you hit this divide of also not wanting to ask, right? Not wanting to say, oh, I need a device or I don't have internet access. It almost becomes like the have and have nots, the sense of embarrassment of saying like, oh, you know, and I know with, with this instance that I'm thinking about, even at the college level, it took a, a professor to like negotiate the steps in order to get the laptop because they didn't want to 
go and they were sort of embarrassed because they didn't have that equipment at home already. And, and so I think as we think about the teachers that we're reaching out to is really connecting with those students and seeing where, you know, we can bridge those gaps, so to speak, to, to get them to the point of, oh, I recognize they're trying to do this on their phone. Maybe we can get them one of the Chromebooks that uh, the Philly used to support their, their students or something like that in order to facilitate those sorts of interactions. Because I know a lot of students and parents too won't speak up and say that they don't have access to this resource. So with uh, our next guest is Jim Frankel from Music First. Uh, if you don't know too much about, I'm gonna flip to Quaver, uh, mostly K through eight, right, Sean, as far as what it's doing. Uh, I've had the privilege of meeting with Quaver many times and seeing their, their systems in place. Uh, Music First, Jim will talk a little bit about how that's broken up and what he's seen. And of course, they've been doing a lot of outreach and assistance uh, along the technological divide as well. Sure. Thanks, Ryan, and thanks to all the other guests uh, for talking about this very, very important uh, topic. Music First has been around for eight years, and our strap line is teach music in a connected world. To be quite honest, <clears throat> this isn't the way we wanted to get uh, huge exposure to school districts around the world, actually. But in the last month, we have signed up and given away over a half a million accounts uh, to kids, mostly in the United States, but all over Europe and, and Australia as well as the uh, uh, pandemic has kind of affected different geographical locations. So we, we are a K to 12 solution. Primarily uh, our customers are band, choir and orchestra directors as well as middle school and high school general music, AP music theory teachers. So we had a huge group of uh, educators already using our stuff. And when this whole thing went down, we were one of the very first people to say, hey, we're going to give this away. Uh, little did we realize exactly how many uh, we were going to be giving away. So 500,000 accounts is, is a retail value of $10 million. So when we turned on the tap and said, come and get it, we were not quite expecting that. I mean, it was a bit of panic, I would say, in that first between the week of uh, March 9th and March 13th when, when, when we started offering our tools. Uh, the rush was extraordinary. And I think that um, from our perspective, what I was trying to do from day one on my very first, web I did a webinar with like 500 music teachers that first Sunday before the 16th. So it was the 15th. And, and they were all saying, how do I do exactly what I have been doing in my room? How do I, how do I, in this new world? And my answer was very clearly, you don't, okay? It's a, it's a brand new landscape. So please don't try to recreate what you've been doing. Um, number one, you don't know what the students, to Latasha's point, you have no idea what the students are going through. Right? You have no clue what their daily life, you don't know if their parents have been impacted, you don't know if they have sick relatives, you have no clue what's going on in their world. So to expect them to show up at 8.02 a.m. till 8.44 a.m. every day on some kind of live thing where you're going to have a rehearsal over Zoom is just let it go it you know let that idea go what you're trying to do instead is grapple with this new normal and figure out well what can i do for my students what can i do to keep them interested to keep them make this the little we've always thought of the arts as the as the kind of oasis in a school day where kids are coming on Ah, oh, here's the here's the, the the time when I can be creative. Here's a time where I can express myself. Here's a time where I can maybe blow off a little steam, get rid of a little stress. And that's really what we need to maintain, in my opinion. Um, Music First is interesting in that we offer a wide variety of software. So NoteFlight, which was the first company that said, "Here, have our stuff for free." Soundtrap, Practice First, um, Sight Reading Factory, Aurelia, Musician, Groovy. We we, I mean, we have uh, nine or ten different software titles. Um, which, you know, address every aspect of a music curriculum. And we know that our teachers are figuring out how to do that. Uh, to Sean's point, we've been doing a ton of training as, as Quaver, as I'm sure every other company. Ton, we do daily trainings with our teachers. We have a Facebook group that is extremely active with people asking, how do I do this? How do I do that? Um, what I've learned, uh, Ryan, and then I'll, I'll, I'll pass it on, is that music teachers are the most resilient of all educators. Music teachers are the best, uh, and, and arts teachers in general. We've the, the, the five, six of us on this call, we already knew that, um, but, but it, it has really become apparent in that they're being really creative, trying to figure out, okay, well, I can't teach my band class. So what can I do to keep them engaged? Hey, everyone, help. And they're doing it. Um, they're, they're giving their students composition activities, sight reading activities. Um, hey, go and record yourself and maybe try to find a friend using the acapella app or however the, they're being super resourceful trying to get these kids engaged, 
trying to, I, I know for me, when I was a kid playing music, it was the way I escaped my daily life. And if ever we needed an escape, uh, this is it, right? You know, so for these kids, uh, I, I think the kids are being amazing. I think their parents are truly heroes trying to figure this out, trying to get there. I mean, I have two daughters, uh, my, my high school age daughter, you know, she doesn't want to go to class. She doesn't, she, she wants to like relax and hang out and Netflix and watch The Office for the hundredth time. So, you know, my point is, is that teachers are being fantastic. Teachers, uh, students are being fantastic. Parents are, we will get through this. And what it means for the future is that I don't think there'll be as much resistance now that teachers have seen the, the power that it can have um, to extend a classroom. Uh, I think that there'll be some wide, really widespread adoption of some of these tools that maybe people have been holding a, a little bit at a distance because they weren't so sure how it fit into their curriculum. So fascinating conversation. I really appreciate uh, listening to Latasha and Frank uh, as well as what the folks at Quaver are doing. So thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you, Jim. I, I think it, there's there was a lot of thoughts that were sort of streaming around in my head as this was going. My, my son also said said something interesting. Um, and he said, wow, it made me realize, you know, he's a high school senior, how much downtime there is in school versus uh, he gets his assignments, he does his assignments, he's done in whatever X amount of time. And I'm wondering, you know, what is going to pull over into the next school year? Is there going to be some sort of hybrid? Is there going to be some, you know, how we used to do the AM, maybe some districts do the AM, PM kindergarten, you go for that half day, you know, is it going to become a, not necessarily in kindergarten, but it will become maybe, maybe seniors or, or not, sorry, not seniors, maybe students look at it from more of what can we do in this hybrid model of where we're actually, uh, you know, learning in traditional and then we're online for a period of a time or, or something along those lines. And then as I pose these sort of thoughts or questions to the panel, I encourage um, people in the audience that are watching via YouTube to go into the comments and add your questions and then they get they get pointed over to us and, and we'll throw those out but you know has there been any thoughts on um, from the district perspective and maybe this is early uh, of doing more online courses or incorporating more of this online element into traditional learning or is it you know is the thought like it, we're just going to go back to our normal schedule at the start of the school year and you know forget this ever happened quote unquote right not that we could but can I just say one thing before? Sure, Jim. Um, so I'm heavily involved in these Facebook groups that you mentioned earlier. Yes. And there was a whole thread going around by a couple of music teachers that was saying, make sure you do a really bad job with this. Because if they see that music teachers can do this online, maybe they won't need us. I'm going to say emphatically what a ridiculous notion that is and how short-sighted and incredibly bad uh, of, a, of a position that is to take. If ever... There was going to be a time where people were going to be rushing back to us going, please, we need to be in school. <laughs> this is what it's going to teach us is how important school is as a community, as a place for kids to go to feel a part of a family. I don't think music teachers have anything to worry about. When mm -hmm. it comes to that. What I do think is that the idea of technology, and I'm sure Quaver feels this way as well, has always been to extend our teaching, not to replace it. The music teachers are the most important people in the darn building, in my opinion. So it's not to replace us, it's to extend it so that when the kids are not with us, so when kids are at home doing whatever they're doing when they're not with us, maybe they'll look at our subjects. So for me, uh, from our perspective in the technology world, I've been in this for 30 years, is the hybrid approach would be live instruction enhanced by uh, asynchronous extended instruction to keep it to keep it moving. So thanks yeah. for letting me uh, bump in. Yeah, absolutely. And that's very much, uh, at, at least for Montclair State that I mentioned before, that's the method that they use. You know, it's fo the focal is the live instruction. The extension is is the the uh, the technology platform and they're using Canvas where you can post a lot of things and get discussion going that's outside of the classroom. And the idea of extending that sort of learning time that gets out of it, I think some, as, I know as a band director, I struggled with getting students to practice. I know that's a shock, right? You always get people to practice in, but you look at it from the, the side point of maybe this expands their opportunities or expands their interest. And maybe they're not necessarily practicing trumpet, but they're practicing guitar or they're writing their own songs or, you know, they're not just isolating their music participation during that 45 minute period during the school day. Yeah. Could I pile onto that just real fast? Sure. I always say, like, we want the music room door to be like this, wide open. And this is the best opportunity to just like you and Jim both said, like, this is a chance to see interest points that we have not had a chance to maybe explore as much. And 
put music in the classroom, which is now the family room and living room of these homes and let parents see it as a moment of like, ah, it's a break. It's not science. It's not, we always want to elevate to be at a level equal to science and math. We have a chance to actually go well above it and be like a foundational community glue in a school right now. So I really think I agree with Jim. Do not waste this opportunity that we see right now. Mm -hmm. Something that I would say, Ryan, um, from the district perspective, I think I'm looking at it with my team. We're doing virtual meetings every week. So for us, this is incredible because we don't really get a chance to meet but once or twice a year. So meeting every week, we're really getting some really rich dialogue around what we need to do. And one of the main things we talked about is this is an excellent opportunity for us because the wonderful part is that we have folks who are saying the arts are so important. It's keeping us all level and sane during this really hectic time. So I feel really great. I would tell any music teacher, I don't think you have anything to worry about. It's all about how to connect it. So we're thinking about more expansive ways to engage our students. Um, we have students who have great interests and we just don't have the time in the school day to help them. So what we're doing is we're pushing, let's give some enrichment classes for them. Let's think about how can we engage them in the content or specific instruments that we can't get to during the day. So guitar and maybe bass and coming up with bands and ensemble. So I think that this is just an amazing opportunity for us. We have a brand new um, music technology lab. We're expanding that program because now we can engage more students farther along in the district and it doesn't have to do with your proximity to a building. We can take that same knowledge and we widespread it throughout our campus and throughout our city. So we're excited about what this is gonna, you know, give for our students. Just more opportunity, more access to music education. Yeah, for sure. And, and I, I would add, just think there's, you know, Jim touched on it, but there's such a hunger to be around people, right? That there's so many memes and stuff. That first band rehearsal is gonna be tears, right? Everybody and I think that to Jim's other point, right, that the, the first gut reaction from everybody, particularly the artists in the world, the week that we were home was I have to figure out how to normalize my life and find tools to do what I would do. And, and I'm looking at, at Richard's question about um, being able to play in real time. And that's been such a, a topic of conversation. Nobody has really cracked the code. And, and um, just this past Saturday, GMEC partnered with David Ellison and, and the Schools Out Initiative, and, and I watched eight hours of metalheads talking about, you know, what they're doing to, to stay active. And I think what I saw, and I think the same in education, first we initially jumped to how do we keep doing what we're doing? And then when the reality that that can't happen set in, everybody kind of looked at where, okay, now what can I do? And the musicians went to writing and, and you know, the educators went to finding new ways to push out things. And you know, I know my two kids are, are you know, my, one of my a friend from high school was speaking on one of the morning shows and she said, let your kids get bored because that's when creativity will happen. And I think we're seeing that. And so, but I think we're also realizing the limitations of what we need. Okay, great. I wrote this song. Now I can pass it around and have people collaborate, but I also need to be in a room with musicians and, and make music. And I, you know, I shared with the group as we we're getting on, I was inspired by the eight hours of live stream to start learning how to scream metal music. And so my kids are now all of a sudden asking questions about metal music. And it's these, these things that are happening so organically um, that we'll take back into our, our classrooms. But I think we'll just have this mentality of all of my life as an educator, I thought I had to teach this thing. The curriculum said this thing, the district mandated this thing. And we all learned a pretty valuable lesson, you know, that that thing doesn't really matter right now. Um, how do we bring that all back together? And I definitely think it's going to be, be a hybrid, you know, to your initial question. No, I don't think anybody's thinking about it yet. Uh, we don't even know what the summer camp situations are going to look like. So what September has in stores is a whole nother thing. But I do know that there are a lot of people who, you know, their full-time job has been curriculum work and assessment work, and they're all reimagining that right now. I'm gonna, I find it really hard to believe that they're going to leave that all behind and go back to what was and, and not take some of the learning that happened through this time. So I think it's exciting for us, you know, as everybody said, our, our folks are, are definitely gonna be there smiling and, and you know, leading the charge to, to celebrate all of it. So Jim, this one's for you. It's a, did you mention that when students submit an assignment, the teachers can download on their end and mix them into digital performances? Oh, you're muted, Jim. 
Sorry about that. Trying to cut down on background noise. Um, of course. Yeah. So one of uh, you know every technology platform, or at least should have the uh, ability for students to keep a digital portfolio. Um, one of the things that I'm um, I'm hoping is a silver lining from all this craziness that we're in is that kids are going to create some amazing things between now and the end of this school year and 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 uh, the ability to uh, keep track of that to to have a, a digital portfolio filled with audio recordings video recordings compositions um, quizzes everything that you've taken will be a really good artifact <laughs> uh, to see what these kids did during these times to Frank's point and this is what I what I've been saying from day one please don't try to do the same thing let's think of a new way let's think of new ways to connect with these kids think about all the years Years you've wanted the kids to be better sight readers, um, but have never had the time because the concert's always there. Or you wanted your your choir kids to compose, but oh no, no that's not realistic because I've got I'm, I'm you know I've got all state auditions coming up. So I really think you know the uh, what these kids leave behind during this time in terms of their output, their creative output, their recordings, their videos. I mean, we're seeing it. You see it every day on Facebook. I'm sure like the rest of you, I get all choked up watching these videos of what these kids are producing. Uh, it's an, it's extraordinary. So yes, of course, we have the ability to download all that and archive it. Uh, but I'm more excited about what, what's coming out of these kids over the next couple of months while, while we're all dealing with this and trying to figure it out. Yeah, I think one of the things that's that's interesting, even when you think in terms of like technology and usage, and even when we think of something like lessons, you know, it'd be very typical of like one-on-one -on -one sitting next to your teacher and you're learning this apprenticeship sort of model that goes into it. But there's there's already like one of our affiliates, like Music Tutor, already exists in that space to offer these digital lessons and these group lessons and live lessons. So, you know, you, as we encourage teachers to think sort of outside the box and what's going to carry over, you know, these virtual lessons may be available and maybe they they can find their instructors online and they wouldn't have thought about that before, but they can do the lessons from their home or from a school or or whatever that goes into that versus you have all the expense. I remember my parents running me back and forth to lessons, you know, all the time. And that's, a, that can be, that can be difficult for some people. So as these more and more and more of these tools come online, you wonder, uh, you know, what's, I think instead of worrying about that sort of preservationist uh, aspect that you were talking about, Jim, it's really expanding how we're looking at things as, as it's going forward. Uh, I'm just going to ask the audience if there's any questions or anything else that comes up, or if we have any sort of final statements from any of the any of the group members as questions are coming in. You know, uh, Ryan, you mentioned about like the cost of uh, for students and all that for taking lessons online. This is also a, a same thing. I keep thinking about the teachers all the time too. Ultimately, the teacher's success is the student's success. It's just such a great time for the teachers and the cost being so much lower for them to engage in just their own professional development time and research and all that. This is a great time for them to really dig in and be students. And I love seeing them do it. I mean, there is nothing better than taking a teacher who's been teaching for 35 years and all of a sudden has learned something new. There is no better thing than to teach someone over 50 something new that they did not think that they could learn. It is very, very rewarding. I mean, a 14 year old expects to learn something new and they'll kick and scream the whole time they're learning it, but <laughs> an adult will not. <laughs> And one other thing uh, to Ryan's question specifically, uh, Zoom, uh, you know, the, the platform that we're using right now is going to be a dirty word for a little while because my kids are like, oh, I got another Zoom, right? How many, all of us sitting on here have been on multiple Zooms, right? However, the concept of online teaching, online lessons has been around forever. I, I did, um, I was on the dissertation hearing, I, I was, you know, doctoral student defending their dissertation and I was on the panel eight years ago about doing trombone lessons using Skype. So this concept has been around for a long time. It's because of the situation that we're being put in that all these, my, my wife's a ballet teacher, right? All these, they, she can't teach, right? So they're, they're all resorting to this kind of online world to do teaching in this time. And I do think that it will, even though Zoom right now is, is it's got a connotation to it. Any way you do this, it will be a thing moving forward because everybody's been doing it. The, the norm has become this environment. And so to have a trombone lesson, because you don't have a trombone teacher that lives anywhere near you, uh, and do it over, over Zoom or Skype or Google Meet or however you're going to do it, that's a thing now. It's absolutely a thing. And I think it's a good thing, um, even though uh, we probably all are going to wince a little while when we hear the word Zoom. Anyway, that's just my two cents on it.
Yeah, I would I would jump on that because um, the other thing that I think you know I didn't mention earlier that's going to come out of that is the the mechanism that we just created for virtual collaboration across the district, right? I've seen teachers who have not known each other that have been in the district together for 10, 15 years now collaborating through these mechanisms and you know attending a training online, which you know I don't people would have looked at that in, in six months ago and thought ah, I'm not really comfortable with that, but now out of necessity it's what we're doing and people are so I think that professional learning community that's going to come out of this the ability to host virtual sessions pd sessions for you know who's using quaver where's the music first crew who's trying to do songwriting who are doing all these things and you know we've and, and i i don't want to lose sight there was a question earlier to me from paula don which if, if the paula don is our director of gifted learning and, and is an incredible uh, educator and human being and you know she asked the question about could we run music clubs across the city for students to supplement the music classroom and, and that's something that we've dabbled with and, and tried we have our all city programs but you know right now we're moving our music industry programming our dash program into online environments so it's no longer the program at strawberry mansion high the program at dobbins it's all the kids in the city of philadelphia interested in the music industry you know getting into a room together and, and instilling that collaboration and so you know we're now able to use these tools when we get out of all this to, to be able to have these citywide clubs um, and, you know, we, we, we did something like this many, many years ago at Jim's Point, none of it's new. When I was still teaching, we collaborated with um, Sisler High School in Winnipeg um, in Canada. And our, you know, we had kids from Sisler teaching our kids through Skype how to do video game design. So I think, you know, and, and then my, my wife has now learned about Twitch and video game channels, right? So there's these things that our extended network is being exposed to that have existed kind of in these secret silos that I think are definitely going to be the tools that we use to be a more collaborative industry in, in that in music education and with our students. I know. I figured. I figured that out. I pulled the gym. So the uh, one of the interesting things about uh, about professional development days, right? Often they're limited, and teachers don't really get together. And I've felt I've been to many districts where uh, small, large, you know, everything in between, where they say, oh, "I don't even know this person," and this music. They don't even know the other uh, teachers that are in that that music space with them. So you know, I think as Frank pointed up, this this building these online communities extends over to the teachers about being able to meet and be able to interact and and do these things. And uh, we did get a, another question. I think this is more toward the group, but basing more core curriculum on tech will further exasperate inequities for schools that get less funding. So how can we plan for that with a lens for equity? I want to jump in, Ryan. I think that the way to plan for it is thoughtfully and equitably. So when you're talking about building core curriculum, if you're looking at it from the club delivery, you have to think about what's the best delivery method for your environment. So I know for a district like mine, it's going to depend on the school because for my schools, I might have one music teacher in that school. So I want to think really carefully about what the resources in that school are. So talking with the school leaders and talking with the stakeholders at that site and thinking about how you can do it. Um, I think if you don't have access to the technology, you want to create just a rich of a learning opportunity for students who don't have access. So I don't think it's going to exasperate the inequity. It really help, requires us as either district leaders or school leaders to make sure that we're giving great access for our students um, and really making sure that no matter what it is, it's not the tool that is driving the success, but it's the content and it's the interaction and engagement that students have. Yeah, I would certainly echo that. That's kind of where my thoughts went. And, and I think you, to, the, to drive that point, we're not basing the curriculum on tech. The curriculum is what they're learning. The tech are the tools. And you know, my, my last teaching assignment was at a school called School of the Future that we built in partnership with Microsoft. And it's a beautiful building and people traveled from around the world to see it. And I think they were always disappointed when they got there because they, I don't know if they expected like conveyor belts and robots teaching the kids, but they would see a room full of kids with a teacher in front of them delivering instruction and there was a laptop on their desk but you know that was just replacing the notepad and, and it became you know it's still centered on great teaching and learning and I think the other side of that is you know when we look at how much as a district we spend on curriculum resources you know compared to what we just spent to equip you know with, with our purchase it's it's a little less than half of the district students right about a third so 
multiply that times three, it's still probably less than we spend on curriculum, add the cost for the, the software to go with it. Um, it's, it becomes cost neutral in terms of moving and migrating to an environment that serves all students, assuming that you know the other pieces are in place. Is Comcast gonna extend free internet beyond this? Maybe, maybe not. If they don't, then homework can't be given through. So there's, there's gonna be those inequity pieces that have to be addressed, but you know, there's an equal argument that if we're teaching kids to do songwriting and composition and not using technolo technology-based tools, you know, we may be eliminating the divide now, but the minute they graduate, they're entering a world where they're already obsolete. So we really do have to wrestle with where that balance is and make sure that both sides are accounted for and, and do what we need to do to move us there the right way. Brian, if I can just say one last thing. Sure. On the digital divide has been my main motivating factor as a music educator for the last 30 years. I started my teaching, Latasha, I started in Irvington, New Jersey, and uh, an amazing district, amazing kids with tons of challenges. And then I went to Saddle River, the richest district in New Jersey, tons of challenges, but money wasn't one of them. So I've always had that in my head that it was so horrible to see that, the haves and the have nots one year apart. Um, at least the internet has flattened out that equity uh, issue to a degree, not completely, um, because it used to be not that long ago that the only way kids would have any exposure to technology in a school was in a very expensive uh, computer lab, a music technology lab. I mean, that school of the future that Frank talked about, that was a very, very expensive undertaking. Uh, the idea of, uh, you know, both Quaver, Music First, No Flight Soundtrap, whoever the company is being available on the internet so that uh, you, can, you can get to it on a phone, um, it has at least flattened that equity curve substantially, not completely not completely you still need to you still need the internet to get there but it's certainly one huge step in the right direction yeah i think it's one of the things that's interesting i remember early on in my teaching career and i think we can we can wrap this up um it, how expensive a, a music technology lab was that you try to put in place i think my quote was a hundred plus thousand dollars for a small lab and now you look at what's available for necessary sort of through free through apps that you can do. I know there's composition, there's, there's recording apps, there's all these things that they have that accessibility. So I think that bar is gradually coming down. And it's, it's ultimately, it's, I think it's like, you know, what, what do you want to create, right? What do you see this, how, what direction do you see this going? And then you build toward that and see if we got one more. Okay, that's it. All right, I think I'm just waiting to see if we have another question coming in. Okay, so this is talking about, uh, this one is from Walt Strait, whom we know. Um, other than the Zoom, Skype lessons and emerging virtual uh, ensemble performances opportunities, are there any other changes uh, do we foresee in the teaching of traditional instrumental music? I want to jump in. I see massive changes to traditional instrumental music. Um, I mean, I'm here in New Jersey, and so we're actually getting ready to adopt new standards. We're in that process now. And I think traditional instrument music cannot be just focused on just the instruction of the song we're playing for the concert. We really do have to shift to those four processes that the National Core Arts Standards are talking about with composing and creating, with performing, which I think we all have down packed. That's not a problem, but really the connecting and the responding. So I think that you're really gonna to have to think about not only, I, I, I told my team, this is really moving from production to focusing on process and really helping our students understand it's not what we do that we're done. But thinking about the process, thinking about the elements, thinking about mood, thinking about all those wonderful things that we're teaching for the performance aspect, but how it impacts and how it has a longstanding impact for our students. And so traditional instruments and music Sure, we're going to have to do the lessons, but really having students really kind of start to rip apart those pieces and analyze them and give them that type of brain. Sometimes we uh, we do it for our students, and we need to give them the gift of that analysis to really get deeper and richer into what they're learning. And I think it should take instruments music to a completely different level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and That's I would be a natural extension, right? Yep. Yeah, I just want to add too, and I was a jazz band teacher. I mean, rehearsal time is like the most important 
you know, time. And so to think about when are we going to listen to Duke Ellington? When are we going to talk about Duke Ellington? When are we going to do all these other cool things that I spent the last 30 years figuring out? I think technology buys you, like we've all said, the time outside of your traditional class time. And the teacher now is comfortable with those tools as an educational component that is valuable. And now they'd feel like, okay, we can spend our 45 minutes playing and working on our articulation because I know when they go home, there's going to be this very rich other component that I keep saying I want to listen to jazz and I want them to hear swing and all that stuff. So I think that's really, like you said, I think that that's going to be the big change is it's always been there. I continue to say that the teacher is the barrier, their comfort level with that will be the differentiator in the equity for this technology for the kids. You know, so I think that's the valuable part of that for instrumental music for sure. Yeah, and I, I would just add that, you know, for us in Philadelphia, an adjudication culture is, is not something that's strong and in place. And I think you know, when you see the rapid shift that some of our national organizations who, you know, for a large part of their work is uh, presenting and, and professional development and, you know, competitions, those things are all being reimagined. All of those organizations have quickly shifted to resources for online learning. So, you know, my hope is that, you know, some of the soul searching will happen there as well in terms of the value of, of this. And there's a lot of, you know, five year running state champions that didn't get to compete this year. And, and the band directors will wake up and the students will wake up and, and realize, okay, we're still back and we're still playing our instruments. Um, and and I, I think, I think some of what's happening in terms of the leadership and I'll, I'll shout out Walt because I know he's with Con Selmer and just uh, advertised to our teachers that they're moving their summer institute to a virtual environment, right? So things like that happening where folks are used to being in a room and having these organic hands-on experiences with something like a, a, an instrument that's so tactile still are putting themselves in that space, but thinking about it in a, in a different philosophy. And I, I think um, I'm really hopeful that we'll see that shift in the, in the overarching bodies of music education, particularly in our country, to just reevaluate what matters and what we're promoting and encouraging and, and really moving towards process and, and experience. And I think, you know, last piece, I think some of our band directors are gonna be shocked with their kids, the ones that their instruments are home are coming back doing. Not all of them, because there's a lot of challenges. I know it's hard to play in a house with four other people, but, um, some of our kids are gonna go nuts and listen to a bunch of stuff and come back in with new influences and find these online lesson resources and, um, and take advantage of it. And they're gonna come back. And you know, one of the things we always promote to our teachers is get out of the way sometimes, right? Let the kids do their thing and let them take over the leadership. And you know, sometimes the world forces that upon us. This is one of those times. And, and uh, it's gonna be interesting to see the, the shift for, for people getting back to it. Jim, any closing statements before we, we no, say goodbye? I, I feel like we could go on for at least another 30 minutes. But. Yeah, it's been a real treat listening to everybody. And uh, thanks for allowing us to highlight what we've been doing. Um, hats off to all the teachers out there and to the kids and to organizations like the Grammy Music Education Coalition for having these types of conversations. It's, it's great. Thank you. Absolutely. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Lee Whitmore to close us out. Thanks, Dr. Zellner, Ryan, great conversation. Special thanks to all of our panelists. So Jim, Sean, uh, Frank, <clears throat> Latasha, so good to have you here. And I was just um, uh, fixed on the entire conversation. Ryan's right. We probably could have gone on longer. And this was a great second um, entry into this series. So um, please, please let uh, share this. It will be archived on our YouTube channel and um, let folks know we're going to continue these conversations on a weekly basis um, for as long as they're useful and we will share them broadly. Um, next week we will have another like we did last week thought leaders forum on what are things going to look like when we get back into school what's going to be different um, next school year whenever whenever we can walk back into school buildings and so um, that's going to be a great conversation that will include some of our coalition members and some senior school district leaders. Keep your eyes peeled on our Facebook page or Twitter or, um, uh, you know, just send us a note. We will announce who, but um, in more detail. But always uh, remember Wednesdays, one o'clock Eastern time, um, 10 a.m. Pacific. This is where we'll be. And we've um, built out a schedule for the next couple of months. So 
I'm excited. Um, Ryan will host some of these. We're so happy to have you all here. Uh, and to echo some of the comments of our panelists who were fantastic today, stay safe. Um, if you need anything that we can help you with or any of the panelists, drop them a line. Um, the coalition is here with um, more than 70 affiliates to do everything we can to support you all in, uh, in what is a challenging time, but that also has some exciting potential too. You know, I'm trying to look at it uh, glass half full as well. Okay, so we're learning things, we're communicating with each other closely and in different ways. So continue to make music at home for school. Thanks to all of our panelists. Thanks, Dr. Zellner. Ryan, you did a great job. We're going to sign out for now, and we'll see you next Wednesday uh, at the same time, 1 o'clock Eastern. Oh, and tomorrow, keep your eyes um, peeled to our uh, Facebook page. We'll have another uh, in a series of streamed um, uh, Instagram conversations. Our artist ambassador, Sophia Basler, who's a, just an amazing cellist, will be on with one of her friends, streamed uh, Instagram Live for conversation, watch there, and then we jump over to our Facebook page and uh, stream some, some music for everybody to enjoy. Invite your students. Thanks, everybody. Have a great one, and we'll talk with you Take soon. Take care. Thank you.